Line-by-line -line explanation of the poem, Ode on Melancholy by John Keats. Line 1. No, no, go not to Lethe, neither twist. The speaker advises against seeking forgetfulness or oblivion, represented by the river Lethe in Greek mythology. This line serves as a warning against escapism, emphasizing the importance of confronting sorrow rather than trying to escape it. The reference to Lethe, the river of forgetfulness in the underworld, symbolizes the erasure of painful memories. By advising against this, the speaker underscores the necessity of facing one's emotions head-on. Line 2. Wolfsbane, tight-rooted, for its poisonous wine. This line introduces Wolfsbane, a toxic plant, as a symbol for harmful means of numbing pain. Drinking its poisonous wine metaphorically represents choosing self-destructive ways to cope with sorrow. The imagery of danger conveyed by the plant's poisonous nature reinforces the previous warning, highlighting the peril of turning to such measures to avoid dealing with grief. Line 3. Nor suffer thy pale forehead to be kissed. The pale forehead indicates a person already affected by sorrow or distress. The personification of nightshade, a poisonous plant, kissing the forehead suggests an intimate yet dangerous embrace. This further advises against letting sorrow deepen through harmful influences, urging the reader to avoid such perilous comfort. Line 4. By Nightshade, Ruby Grape of Proserpine. Nightshade is another toxic plant, associated with death and darkness. The mythological reference to Proserpine, Persephone, the queen of the underworld, links nightshade to themes of death and the afterlife. The contrast in imagery between the alluring ruby grape and the plant's deadly nature highlights the deceptive appeal of harmful comforts. Line 5. Make not your rosary of berries. berries come from the yew tree, which is often associated with death and funerals. Using yew berries for a rosary suggests meditating on or dwelling excessively on death and sorrow. The religious connotation of a rosary, usually a symbol of prayer and contemplation, is placed in a morbid context, emphasizing the dangers of fixating on grief. Line 6. Nor let the beetle, nor the death moth be. Beetles and death moths are symbols of death and decay. The imagery of darkness evoked by these creatures creates a somber, funereal atmosphere. By personifying these insects as potential companions in sorrow, the poem deepens the theme of death, cautioning against seeking solace in morbid symbols. Line 7. Your mournful psyche, nor the downy owl. Psyche, representing the soul, is described as mournful, suggesting a soul steeped in sorrow. The downy owl, another symbol of death and darkness, often associated with omens, adds to the imagery of solitude. The owl as a solitary creature emphasizes loneliness and grief, reinforcing the theme of sorrow's isolating nature. Line 8. A partner in your sorrow's mysteries. The idea of companionship in sorrow suggests seeking solace in symbols and creatures of death. The mysteries of sorrow implies that sorrow has its own secrets and depths to be explored. However, this line also warns against finding comfort in dark, morbid symbols, advising against a morbid obsession. Line 9. For shade to shade will come too drowsily. The repetition of darkness, moving from one dark thought to another, leads to lethargy. The imagery of drowsiness suggests a numbing effect, where grief becomes overwhelming and debilitating. This line highlights the cycle of sorrow, implying that indulging in sorrow leads to a continuous, inescapable cycle of darkness. Line 10. And drown the wakeful anguish of the soul. The drowning metaphor indicates that excessive sorrow can overwhelm and suffocate the soul's active, conscious pain. Wakeful anguish suggests a pain that is alert and aware, in contrast to the drowsiness induced by morbid thoughts. This line calls for awareness, implying that it's better to remain actively aware of one's sorrow rather than succumb to it passively. Line 11. But when the melancholy fit shall fall. This line describes the sudden onset of melancholy, treating sorrow as something that can descend unexpectedly. 
The personification of melancholy as a tangible entity that can fall upon a person acknowledges the inevitable experience of sorrow, suggesting that everyone will face bouts of melancholy at some point. Line 12. Sudden from heaven like a weeping cloud. The simile of a weeping cloud compares sudden melancholy to a rain cloud, emphasizing its natural and inevitable arrival. The imagery of rain suggests that melancholy, like rain, is a natural part of life. The emotional weight conveyed by the cloud weeping creates a heavy, sorrowful atmosphere. Line 13. That fosters the droop-headed flowers all. The droop-headed flowers represent individuals affected by sorrow. The line implies that melancholy can have a nurturing effect on those already inclined towards sadness. This natural imagery continues the theme of nature reflecting human emotions, showing how sorrow can influence and shape one's environment. Line 14. And hides the green hill in an April shroud. An April shroud suggests the paradox of life and death, as April is a month of renewal, yet here it is covered in a shroud. The imagery of covering, with the shroud hiding the hill, symbolizes how sorrow can obscure beauty in life. This contrast between April, which signifies spring and new beginnings, and the shroud, representing death, highlights the complexity of sorrow. Line 15. Then glut thy sorrow on a morning rose. The morning rose symbolizes transient beauty and freshness. The line advises to indulge sorrow in something beautiful and fleeting, like a rose. The imagery of overindulgence suggests immersing oneself deeply in the beauty of sorrow, finding solace in the ephemeral. Line 16. Or on the rainbow of the salt sand wave. The rainbow imagery symbolizes fleeting beauty and hope. The salt sand wave represents the transient nature of moments in life, combining elements of both sea and land. This line encourages finding solace in nature's ephemeral beauty, suggesting that the temporary nature of beauty can provide comfort in sorrow. Line 17. Or on the wealth of globed peonies. Globed peonies symbolize lush, abundant beauty. The wealth imagery suggests richness and fullness in nature's beauty. This line continues the theme of finding solace in natural, transient beauty, highlighting the idea that nature's richness can offer comfort in times of sorrow. Line 18. Or if by mistress some rich anger shows. Introducing human emotion and relationships, the line describes a mistress's anger as a source of intense feeling. Rich anger describes anger as something intense and valuable in its own way. This line suggests turning to loved ones for profound emotional experiences, recognizing the depth of human emotions. Line 19. Imprison her soft hand and let her rave. Imprisoning her soft hand suggests holding on to the source of intense emotion, the mistress, tightly. Let her rave encourages allowing the loved one to express intense emotions freely. The emphasis on physical connection highlights the importance of physical and emotional connection in dealing with sorrow, suggesting that intimate relationships can provide solace. Line 20. And feed deep, deep upon her peerless eyes. Feeding deep suggests absorbing and immersing oneself fully in the experience. Peerless eyes indicates the uniqueness and beauty of the loved one's eyes. This line encourages finding solace and meaning in the depth of human emotions, suggesting that true comfort can be found in profound emotional connections. Line 21. She dwells with beauty, beauty that must die. This line acknowledges that beauty is transient and will eventually fade. The personification of beauty, treating it as a living entity that coexists with melancholy, underscores the inevitable nature of mortality. By recognizing that all beautiful things must eventually die, the line reinforces the theme of the fleeting nature of beauty. Line 22. And joy, whose hand is ever at his lips. Describing joy as always being on the verge of departing, this line emphasizes the transient nature of happiness. The personification of joy, treating it as a person, underscores its fleeting nature. This line reinforces the idea that joy is always temporary, highlighting the ephemerality of happiness. Line 23. Bidding adieu, and aching pleasure nigh. 
The line suggests that joy is always saying goodbye, indicating its brief duration. Aching pleasure describes pleasure as something that can turn painful, indicating that intense emotions often carry the risk of becoming sorrowful. The proximity of pain to pleasure emphasizes the close relationship between these two emotions. Line 24. Turning to poison while the bee mouth sips. The line suggests that even as one enjoys pleasure, it can turn sour, symbolized by poison. The image of a bee drinking nectar illustrates how pleasure can quickly become harmful. This metaphor for transience emphasizes the fleeting and potentially dangerous nature of pleasure, reinforcing the idea that intense emotions are inherently unstable. Line 25. I, in the very temple of delight. The temple of delight symbolizes a place or state of ultimate happiness. This line introduces the paradox of delight, indicating that even in the midst of joy, sorrow is present. The use of sacred imagery, likening happiness to a temple, highlights the profundity of this realization, suggesting that joy and sorrow are deeply intertwined. Line 26. Veiled melancholy has her sovereign shrine. Veiled melancholy suggests that melancholy is hidden within happiness. Sovereign shrine indicates a revered, sovereign place, implying that melancholy holds a significant, respected position within the realm of joy. This line underscores the coexistence of joy and sorrow, suggesting that melancholy is an inherent part of true happiness. Line 27. Though seen of none save him whose strenuous tongue. This line suggests that only those who speak passionately or intensely can recognize melancholy within joy. Strenuous tongue implies effort and intensity in expression. This line highlights the idea that understanding the deep connection between joy and sorrow requires a certain level of emotional insight and expression. Line 28. Can burst joy's grape against his palate fine? The metaphor of bursting a grape suggests experiencing the full, intense flavor of joy. Palate fine indicates a refined, sensitive appreciation. This line emphasizes the idea that truly experiencing joy involves recognizing and accepting its inherent connection to sorrow, suggesting that only those with a deep, refined sensitivity can fully appreciate this complexity. Line 29. His soul shall taste the sadness of her might. The line suggests that by deeply experiencing joy, one will also encounter the profound sadness that accompanies it. The sadness of her might implies the powerful, inevitable sorrow that comes with intense joy. This line underscores the idea that true emotional depth involves an awareness of the interconnectedness of joy and sorrow. Line 30. And be among her cloudy trophies hung. The final line suggests that those who fully understand the depth of joy and sorrow will be immortalized among the achievements or trophies of melancholy. Cloudy implies something ephemeral or ambiguous. This concluding image reinforces the idea that true emotional understanding involves a recognition of the complex, transient nature of human experiences. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.